Hey guys, welcome back to Jess and Ray's Romance. Today is the start of a new reading vlog. I am starting these historical romances. I'm so excited about it because they've been highly anticipated for me. At least three of the four have been highly anticipated. Ollie's just gonna be walking around in the background as usual. Buddy, what you doing? You gonna come sit right here? So the first book I wanted to include for this reading vlog was Her Night with the Duke by Diana Quincy. I really like this kind of like forbidden romance that this has going on. The heroine is a widow and her stepchildren are kind of close in age to her. I think one of them is around her age. The boy and she doesn't get along with him and the girl she is closer to. She's heading actually to go visit her stepdaughter. Her stepdaughter's about to be engaged to be married and on her way there she has to pull over at an inn because it's like dark and stormy night. The weather is terrible. She meets this guy at this inn and you know they have a little rendezvous that night. But what she doesn't know is that this guy is actually her stepdaughter's fiance. So this has like some forbidden elements and I'm so excited to start this one. I've been hearing a ton about it from a lot of booktubers and I know that a lot of people have been doing buddy reads of it so now's the time for me to start. Next I want to read The Raycast. I saw this book making waves a while ago and I had put it on the TBR kind of like got forgotten. But Crystal recently read this book and was absolutely blown away by it and I wanted to try it. So thank you, Crystal, for giving me the push that I needed to start the Raycast. Oh, and I just noticed when I was putting it down, it says The Society of Sirens, so this is actually going to be a series, and I had no idea that this was gonna be a series. I thought it was just like a standalone, but I'm actually excited about that. I wonder if we meet other women that the, this Raycast is friends with, and they're gonna be the heroines in the next book. Is this part of a series? Okay, so I just checked and this is actually part of a series as well. This is book one in the Clandestine Affair series. So, Clandestine Affair series, Society of Siren series, book one. Now I know that this one is book one in the Wallflowers vs. Rogue series. It's a new series by Lenora Bell and I've had so many people suggest like you should definitely read Lenora Bell. She's been a suggestion for our pot Patreon exclusive episodes. A ton of her books have made it on but haven't made it to the final round so I decided I'm gonna pick up this new series, this her most recent series and see what she's all about and hopefully I'll love her. Okay so this one is a Beauty and the Beast trope except the heroine is called Beastly Beatrice, so that's all I wanted to read. I didn't want to read too, too, too much about it, but so Beauty and the Beast, romance, love it, here for it, hopefully I'll like it. And lastly, we have My Last Duchess by Eloisa James. Now I know that this one is a prequel to one of her series, I believe. I think it's the same series that Jessica said that they're a bingeable read. Okay, yes, this is a prequel to The Wilds of Linlow Castle, and the first one, Wild and Love, that cover is like so hot. I'm actually going to pop it up right here because I really love it. He looks super smoldery and dreamy and I've been wanting to start this series so I think that it's kind of perfect that I picked up the prequel and I'm going to start with the prequel first and then go back because the main books in the series have been out for a couple years now and I did not read them. It's been a while since I've read a new Eloisa James. I've read a lot of her backlist so I'm really excited to jump back in to some more Eloisa James novels. I think I'm going to read those in that order but we'll see how it goes. I am a mood reader, so I might flip flop. So I'm about 30%, 31% into Her Night with the Duke, which is about 100 pages. I checked, it's like this much. And I can't say that I love it so far. I am having an issue with the style of writing and the dialogue. I find the dialogue very uninteresting and stilted. And I'm trying to explain in a way why some dialogues just feel very first draft. I don't know how else to put it. How some dialogues feel very first draft to me and once I notice it, it's so hard for me to just be like, okay, well, when you notice that, try to like find something else to enjoy. It's not my nature. In the way that I read, it's just like, oh, it happened again, it happened again. And there's a couple things that I noticed about like the dialogue that it feels very formal and the only way that I think I can explain it is that it feels like somebody, an American, who's trying to put on a posh British accent and they're doing, you know, a bad job of it. And if you're British, you'd be like, ooh, they're trying too hard. That's what the dialogue feels like to me. It feels like it's trying to be too historical. It sounds weird. There's a couple of lines that just sound so wooden and not conversational and it really detracts from my ability to connect with the characters because 
A lot about what you know about the characters comes through dialogue, their personalities, how they interact with other people. And so that does play a big part in whether or not I can connect with the character or not. That's the whole point of reading is experiencing new stories through other people's eyes, namely your characters. So whenever I get lines like this, and I'm not always going to do this in vlogs, but I'm just, just trying to explain so you know, it's like a glimpse into my mind and how my mind works and how this stuff distracts me and it definitely takes away from my enjoyment of a novel. So lines like this, this is after the main characters have slept with each other for the first time, which happens in the first chapter, I'll go back and talk about what's happening after I explain this. So lines like this that say, I realize this is somewhat overdue, but do you suppose I could have the honor of knowing your name? This is literally after they slept together. Doesn't that sound so formal to you? Do you suppose I could have I could have the honor of knowing your name? It just sounds like not like something you would say to somebody who you just slept with. It just sounds very weird, very stilted. I'm like, mm, I don't know. I don't know about it. And then there are some lines that sound too contemporary that are stuck in there. Like there was a scene where she makes a remark saying she can handle herself and the hero says, I'll just bet you can. And I don't know. It sounded like something that a contemporary hero would tell. A heroine. One more little pet peeve and then I promise I'm gonna talk about like the actual story and how I feel about it. So whenever the hero first meets the heroine he's admiring her and he compares her to Botticelli's Venus. There are things that I find very cliche and overused in romance and this is one of them. I can't tell you how many times that I read not even historical it happens in contemporary this is not just historical problem this is just romance and like newbie romance writers and I know that Diana Quincy has written some other ones but just because you're an experienced author does not exempt you from you know these kind of like romance these writing faux pas but to me it signals a lack of creativity whenever you use like literally the most reference painting in romance as Botticelli's Venus and she's coming out of her shell and she's beautiful and she's buxom and of course you're going to compare it to her. Every other author has compared their heroine to her or the hero has in the book, whatever. And the other thing is, and on the flip side with the men, it's comparing them to Michelangelo's David. You're always comparing them to these marble statues that like the greats have created. And there's so many other comparisons that you can make, other pieces of art, other metaphors that you can use. And I'm just, I'm just wanting more creativity. I'm just wanting something to strike me as like, ah, oh, this is new, this is a new way to think about it. And I'm just not getting any of that in this book. So, okay, now I'm gonna talk about the actual story. In the very first chapter, the hero, Elliot, who is a duke, is at an inn, and it's not like a very nice inn. So he's dressing down. He's actually dressing in like clothes that his servant would use to be very understated, not like project that he's wealthy and he has money so that he doesn't get like robbed or anything. And then this woman walks in and she's beautiful and she's actually kind of like wearing pants or something underneath her traveling cloak and he's intrigued. Everyone at the inn has to be just terrible toward her and so he steps in to defend her. Of course there's not another room for her to stay in so she has to stay in the same room and they like share a parlor. I think it's like two separate bedrooms but they share a parlor. So they go up, their first sexual encounter comes out of nowhere. Cause this is in the synopsis that they sleep together and they find out that they're connected in other ways. But I did not get any of the chemistry that would lead me to believe that they were so overcome with passion that they decided to sleep with each other because she is not a very experienced heroine. And that's something that I kind of expected going in, which is totally my fault. It was completely my assumption. I was expecting a heroine who's a widow and she's well-traveled now that she's not married. She can like travel the world. She has her own money. So she's very independent. And I guess I was expecting her to be a little bit more worldly, but she comes off as very innocent a little bit prudish which is fine i don't need all of my heroines to like be vixens or anything but that also doesn't lead me to believe that she'd be the kind of woman to just sleep with some random stranger when the only other person she's ever slept with is her elderly husband who passed away so i just didn't get the connection and i didn't believe that a woman like the heroine which i, I think her name is pronounced leela which her name's delilah but i think it's pronounced delila if i'm not mistaken and i'm sorry for pronouncing that wrong but i just don't believe that delila that leela would sleep with him and then it was supposed to be this phenomenal experience something that she's never felt before but i didn't get that from 
their sex scene or any any of their first encounter, nothing of what they said or did with each other led me to believe that this was anything special. And so that creates a problem for me going forward in the romance because this is supposed to be something magical just happened and it's going to haunt them and mess with the rest of, you know, what's going to happen in the novel. One thing that I did love is that finally she was able to sleep with somebody without this is supposed to be like the end result is I want to get pregnant because she was married before and though her husband was elderly and had two other kids that was just expected like you're expected to get pregnant she never did she thinks she's infertile I don't think she's going to be or she could be and that would be a nice change if she actually does not get pregnant by the end of this novel but here's why I'm not loving the hero the hero really likes her and they, he discovers after they have some pillow talk that she's actually the daughter of a Marquess. And he would have never guessed that she was the daughter of a nobleman because she is of from Middle Eastern descent. Her mother was Middle Eastern and married the Marquess. And her mother's family were like wealthy merchants, traveling merchants. There's definitely a stigma going on around that, which... I would expect but also the hero doesn't have any points in his favor because whenever he's thinking about what he wants in a wife he looks at Leela and he's like oh well she could never be you know society would never like accept her and I'm just like mmm okay so it's gonna be a point of conflict with the hero that she's not a suitable duchess that he needs someone suitable and of course that person that he selected is Leela's stepdaughter and they don't know it yet. So the part that I'm at is Leela and Elliot have both arrived at Leela's stepson who is now the Earl. His name is Edgar, Ed, Edgar, Edward. I don't know, but he's heinous already. I hate him and I have a couple of predictions which I'll get to in a minute. So they finally figured out, oh my God, Tori, Victoria, Leela's stepdaughter, is soon to be betrothed because they are, they're not betrothed yet at all. No announcement has been made, no promises have been made, no, no contracts have been signed. But this whole house party that they're attending is like basically in the lead up to there's going to be an announcement in the near future. And she is immediately horrified, okay? And she goes immediately on the defensive. And she's like, this was a mistake. And you're a horrible person because you slept with me. And you were engaged. And, like, he told her, though, the night they slept together. Like, she was like, oh, do you have a lady or whatever? And she, he was like, not yet, but I'm going to be, I'm soon to be engaged. And so he point blank told her. But now she has a problem with it. Because now it's her stepdaughter that she's thinking of. Which she genuinely does want her stepdaughter, Victoria, to find a love match and all her surviving family, her aunt, Victoria's aunt, and her brother just want her to make a good match, no matter if she likes the guy or not. So at this point in the novel, I'm 30% in, I probably would DNF at this point just because I have so many books on my TBR list, so many books that I'd rather be reading now that I've gotten into this book and I'm not vibing with it, but I think we're going to continue for a couple reasons. And it's because I have a couple predictions and I just want to see if they come true. There was one moment with Leela, she was in her bedroom and the stepson hates her. Hates her. Hates that the father has married, had married Leela. And they don't get along. She's act, He's actually like two years older than her. And there was a moment where he was looking at her in like a very leering sort of way. And I'm wondering if he's going to like assault her and possibly Elliot's going to step in or something. And at some point in the novel, he's going to make a total ass of himself and be just like confirm that he's a trash human. I'm also wondering if Tori, because we know that Tori's not going to end up with Elliot, the Duke. Tori has to end up with someone else and it's going to be a love match. And I just got past the part in the ball because there's a ball being held. And Leela is observing Victoria dancing with the Duke for a little while. And she's talking to Helen who is her, her sister-in-law. And after dancing twice with the Duke, she's now dancing with someone else. Leela's like, who's that? And Helene's like, oh, he's a nobody. That's just like um, the Duke's secretary. And so I'm wondering, is she gonna end up with the secretary? Because we already know that Tori does not feel comfortable with the Duke. She like stammers over her, her words when he's in her presence for no reason, really. I don't know if it's because she's intimidated by him I mean, she thinks she seems to like him, but she just can't seem to string her words together, which honestly reading it the way that Diana Quincy has written it is annoying because there's so many ellipses to indicate that she's stammering, but it's a lot and I don't love it. <laughs> 
I'd rather her just be like, dialogue, she stammered, whatever. Yes, I'm being nitpicky, but this is what happens whenever I'm not meshing with a book. I start noticing all kinds of things that I dislike. So the conflicts that I predict for Leela is ruining the reputation of her stepdaughter, Victoria, because she does not want to ruin her reputation by being caught or by it being known that she slept with her, you know, future fiance. I don't even know if they'll get to that point. And also she doesn't want to hurt Tori. And his conflict is that he does not see her as a suitable wife and he's going to have to change his mind that love wins out and despite her Middle Eastern heritage that he doesn't care what the society thinks. And I don't know. So I'm going to see what I, how I feel at 50% if I'm still nitpicking it to death and just not very interested or not feeling their chemistry as a couple then I think I'm gonna DNF and I'm just gonna move on to the next one <laughs> but I do want to continue just a little bit more and see how I feel if I change my mind or not. I got to 52% and one of my predictions is coming true so I'm gonna put some spoilers right here. <laughs> if you don't want to know what's happening halfway through the book then yeah, don't listen to this part. I'll keep the spoiler up as long as I'm talking about it, but the stepson, Edgar, is 100% propositioning her, and he's a little bit drunk, and I'm just wondering if he is go how far he's going to go because <sighs> he's just made a deal with her. Leela just found out that Edgar, her stepson, didn't inform her that she's entitled to the dower house outright, that her late husband since the property was not entailed, left it to her. Also some very profitable farms. So she owns the dower house and everything that's inside of it. And Edgar earlier was trying to like lease it out to someone else without even telling her that she actually owns it. Um, I wonder if he's strapped for cash. Hunt had mentioned earlier that his finances were sound, but I don't know if he's checked up on them recently. I hope he did because they, sound a they signed a betrothal contract. Anyway, so he's being gross and he told her you know you want this house well in exchange i want you and now you're worldly and you know i'm sure so basically he's just so like i know you'll open your legs for me and i just stopped just so i could come and be like yes this is happening and i called it i'm a little bit interested but mostly because i just want to see if it plays out the way i think it's gonna anyway it's definitely not my favorite if i were to rate it right now i would rate it a three stars and i don't see it going up in my estimation another update I'm 62% in the book. Victoria actually has eloped with the secretary, but it feels very sudden. She leaves a letter for both, one for the Duke and one for Leela, saying that she's in love with the secretary. And I'm like, when did you fall in love with the secretary? Because she and her stepmother just had a conversation. She was just saying how like nice the Duke was and there just wasn't, it didn't seem like there was enough time for her to fall in love with the secretary, like be in love with him, love with him. Now we have 40 more percent of this book of what? The Duke trying to convince Leila to marry her? Him? Is she gonna resist that long? Final reading update. I finished the book and if I wasn't doing a reading vlog, I probably would have DNF'd and it would have been fine because this book was fine. I did enjoy the second half more than I did the first, but it just it just was okay. I wouldn't miss it if I never had read it before. Nothing about it really stood out to me besides the fact that the heroine was of Middle Eastern descent, and I thought that that was nice, but again, it was just okay. There wasn't really chemistry with the two characters. So I'm going to start the Ray Cast next. Fingers crossed, hopefully I will like that one better. I usually have better luck with historicals, honestly. So I'm actually surprised that I did not like this one. One down, three to go. So it's been about a week since I started this vlog. I had a hectic week last week and I didn't read a thing, which I was telling Juliet actually put me in a bad mood because I couldn't read anything. I didn't even reread anything. Normally, if I have something going on, I'll pick up a book that I've already read before so that I'm like reading, but it's nothing to like take my attention away from things that I'm supposed to be doing. I didn't even reread anything. And so I was like in such a bad mood. And finally I'm like, have a week that's free and clear and I don't have anything else to do and I can focus on this reading vlog again. So last night I picked up Love is a Rogue by Lenora Bell. And let me just tell you guys, I'm 
absolutely loving this. The first meeting that we witnessed between the hero and the heroine. The heroine is named Beatrice and she has a nickname, Beastly Beatrice, and it's really sad. So Beatrice had some nerve damage when she was born. The doctor used forceps and it damaged some nerves in her face. And so her face is a little bit slack on one side and she's been called Beastly Beatrice. And to strengthen her face muscles, one of the doctors that she actually liked when she was young told her to read and so she fell in love with words and she loves words so 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 much to the point where she's actually like writing her own dictionary it's pretty funny and that's how we meet the heroine in the beginning but i do want to say that i really like how lenora bell doesn't really linger on whatever feelings that beatrice might have towards people who call her beastly beatrice she has accepted herself and she really loves books and words and she it's just all she wants to do is stay in the country she does not want to go to the, london and have a season like her mom wants her to do she just wants to stay at her brother's estate and just not socialize at all and i can totally relate but while she's at her brother's estate this is supposed to be a time where she has quiet and she can write her dictionary, but her brother is having repairs done on the house and the head like contractor is actually taking place the place of his dad because his dad is sick right now and Wright is so flirty with everyone and Beatrice is like I can't I can't even focus on my words with him outside flirting with everyone. He's just like he can't help himself. So one day Beatrice is eavesdropping when Wright is accepting some refreshments from a maid. And so she like leans over and her glasses fall off her face and she like ducks under and she's like, maybe nobody saw. And Wright takes her glasses and climbs up the trellis to give her back her glasses. And like the moment when he put her glasses back on her face, there was so much sparks, so many sparks were flying. And this is like chapter one. It was amazing. I love these characters. These characters have such phenomenal chemistry. So Beatrice goes to London. Her mother really wants her to get married and Beatrice just doesn't want to cooperate. And she kind of makes a bargain with her mother because she inherited this bookshop from one of her aunts who were disowned because she married somebody like not of the aristocracy. And when she died, she bequeathed Beatrice this bookstore. Her mom wants to sell the bookstore because no woman needs to like own a bookstore. What are you gonna do with that? Beatrice is like, fine, as long as I can keep the books. But her friends are like, wait, no, that's your property. She can't tell you what to do with it. That's like your property. We need to go look at it and see, you know, what it's going on. If it's salvageable, maybe you wanna keep it. And then Wright walks in to her London home because he's trying to get in touch with her brother. He thinks the guy who manages the money for her brother's estate is embezzling money and he wants to like let him know. So he's chatting with Beatrice and her friends are like, looking back and forth between them like why don't you come look at it since you're like an architect why don't you come and see the bookstore and tell us if it's like structurally sound what repairs would need to be made and how much money it would cost to repair it if it is if it can be saved so so that's why our story takes off he becomes the contractor for beatrice's bookshop and there's so much else going on and it's really just so fun. It's phenomenal. I love it. It's the first book I've ever read by Lenora Bell and I really enjoy her writing. I'm definitely gonna have to pick up some more books by her. It's been suggested a lot and so I'm really glad that I started reading this one and I'm just excited. So I'll let you guys know what I think of it at the end. I'm about 200 pages in, about halfway through. It's about halfway. So I'll let you guys know what I think of it in the end, but I think it's gonna be a five star. I'm just like enjoying it so much. And I love Beauty and the Beast retelling, so fantastic, fantastic. Reading update, guys. Last night I finished Love is a Rogue by Lenora Bell, and I really liked it. And I thought it was gonna be a five star, and it almost could have been. There's just something that happened at the end that I found to be a little too like neat and tidy, tied up in a bow. It had something to do with the villain. And without spoiling anything, I just don't really enjoy joy and a romance when characters feel like they have to keep a family member in their life just because they're family but they're toxic but for some reason the hero and the heroine are just like but they're family so you have to tolerate them anyway and let's just like bombard them with kindness and one day they'll change and to me i just don't find that realistic and i don't find it healthy especially when this particular family member has been like this for decades and I just don't like it. So I don't know. The ending fell a little bit flat. Everything up until the final climactic moment 
was really amazing and really awesome. I just wish that the conflict had resolved a little bit better and not cliche. There was a moment where the heroine was like found out something, a secret. It wasn't really a secret. And the villain's the one to clue her in and her response is so typical. It's kind of like, <gasps> you betrayed me, you didn't tell me this, like I don't know you and I'm just like, it's the villain who's telling you this. Obviously he's doing it because he wants y'all, wants you to react this way. I don't know, I just wish that she would have reacted in a less typical, oh no, it's the conflict, she has to be, you know, mad at him for a little while to make things interesting. I just didn't enjoy that for her because I really love Beatrice's character and I was just kind of like, Beatrice wouldn't do that. But anyway, really enjoyed it. 4.5 stars. I will be reading more by Lenora Bell. And last night I started The Ray Kess. I actually decided to get the audiobook for this and so I've been listening to it and I think I'm about 20% in to the book. Let me check. I'm 38% <laughs> into the book. I'm 38% of the way into the book. I have to preface this with saying that I went in pretty blind with The Ray Kess. I didn't know anything beyond the title, what the title conveys, that the heroine is going to be the rake in this scenario, and I really liked it. I'm very interested in it, and I would seen this book floating around people. I know that it has mixed reactions. I know that some people like absolutely love it, five stars, and I know that some people are just kind of like, meh, it's okay or didn't like it or whatever. I haven't really watched like a ton of reviews. Honestly, the only one that I've watched is Crystal and that's the reason why I picked it up is because Crystal really enjoyed this book. But since this is a Ray Kess novel, I'm expecting that this heroine is very confident in her sexuality and she just loves sex and doesn't care what society thinks about that. And I'm so here for it. So I was a little bit surprised that up until this point, up until 38%, this book is very melancholic. It's very sad. And I guess I was just like expecting more of like a joyful sexual experience, but I almost feel like the heroine's punishing herself. And I don't know if that's what other people felt about this. I need to go rewatch Crystal's video. I think I'm gonna go watch her vlog like now because I honestly, I'm just a little bit bored right now. Just a little bit bored. And let me tell you guys, whenever I read the prologue, the prologue, I was like, wow, this is so fascinating. The prologue was very enticing and exciting. And I just feel like the setting where we catch up with the heroine and we meet the hero, it just feels like nothing much is happening. And I'm kind of missing that connection, the chemistry between the hero and the heroine. And I think it's because we get to know the hero and the heroine a lot when they're by themselves and they're thinking about their past. They're very introspective. Both of them are just sad all the time. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about some spoilery things. It's honestly to do with their background, but if you don't want to hear about anything with their background, I'm gonna put a spoiler tag just in case. But Serafina was ruined at a young age. She thought she was in love with this man and this man really strung her along and had sex with her and they were in a relationship in secret. And he kept saying like, oh, I'm gonna marry you one day. And then his father like had him engaged to somebody else. And he was like, oh, well, I'll tell my father about us and that I really want to marry you and of course we know he's lying and he ends up by getting married to somebody else and I haven't really gotten to the point where I believe it becomes like public knowledge that she was having an affair with this guy but she was in love with this guy like her feelings were very passionate towards him she wanted to marry him so she felt wronged and I guess I wasn't expecting like a backstory like that because I feel like the only reason why she's sleeping around is because she feels like she has to like take something back, like he took something from her. So she needs to act like it didn't damage her inside, but she feels so damaged inside. She, I think she's a little bit of an alcoholic. She thinks about drinking all the time and numbing the pain. Like every time she thinks about her past, which is often because she is writing like an expose on like what happened to her, like why she has become a Rakes. She's hoping that like the excitement about finding out like why she became who she is, she's notorious today, is going to like raise funds because she does want to start a school, a house, a sanctuary for ruined women, which I really liked and I wish we got more of that by this point. 
Anyway, I'm digressing. So she thinks a lot about her past and it's hurtful and she doesn't want to think about it. And so she's always talking about wine like in the morning and like she's three glasses in and she looks like a wreck and she like, you know, is upset. And not only does it feel like she's self-medicating with alcohol, it feels like she's self-medicating with sex as well. She's trying so hard to convince herself that sex is meaningless and it needs to stay meaningless because she has fallen into that trap once before and it ruined her. So when the hero comes along, and let me just tell you, the hero is like the sweetest guy ever. I love widow and widower romances. So he is a single dad and he has a lot of sad things that happen too. But I guess the problem is, and the reason why I don't feel a connection with them is because he was so in love with his wife. He was so in love with his wife. And every time he thinks about his wife, he just misses her so much. And so I'm not getting the connection with Adam and Serafina because he's thinking about his wife, Catriona, and how she tragically died. And he feels like a sense of responsibility. He thinks it's kind of his fault. So everything just feels so depressing so far. I was looking for like a fun, I take joy and pleasure in having sex for the sake of sex and it's not because I have a tragic backstory, which, and this is might be just a me thing. It might just be a me thing with the, like the tragic backstory because I'm not a huge fan of like over the top angst and it just feels very angsty, but to the point where I'm bored, not because I'm like overblown with like emotions and I'm like, I need it to stop. <laughs> It's just because I'm bored. I just want them to get on the same page. You can tell that she's self-sabotaging. He has been completely understanding, like you don't want anything more. I understand this, but she keeps like hammering home to him. Like, I don't want anything more than this. Don't act like it. I don't want any affection, like after we have sex. And so basically she wants him to treat her like trash after sex and he's like not trying to start anything with her at all like he has responsibilities and getting involved with her like publicly and more than he ought to could be detrimental to his like career and also to his family his kids but she has to like hammer home every single time like i don't want anything more so she wants him to be like mean and uncaring after sex. She didn't even want him to be friendly. She even told him like, I don't, I don't fuck my friends. You gotta choose. You wanna be my friend or you wanna be my lover? And I'm just like, oh my God, Serafina, you're pushing even his offer of friendship away. And I just feel sad for her because she just can't trust anyone besides her girlfriends. And she feels so sad and alone and isolated because she's at her childhood home and it's just like kind of falling apart. And yeah, it's just, it's just so sad. So sad guys. But yeah, I think I'm gonna go watch Crystal's video cause I just wanna see what she had to say. I feel like when I watched her talk about it for the first time, which was a couple weeks ago, it made me wanna read it. And so I like, I want to go watch her video again and I'll, hopefully I'll like hear something like good things to come like something to look forward to because I am 38% of the way in so I don't know I'm just like hoping to muster some more interest in the story and in these characters and feeling invested in them together because right now I'm invested in both of them just healing inside not necessarily together <laughs> I don't know so yeah gonna go do that. I'll update you whenever I've read more. This is the final reading update because I finished the rest of the books in this vlog. I had two more books to finish for this vlog, The Ray Kess and then My Last Duchess. I finished the audiobook technically last night and I'll get into that in a second and then I listened to the audiobook for this one this morning and it was so sweet and it's not actually like a full book because this includes like the size of the book looks normal like normal book but this is about the size of the actual story and this is includes a the first chapter from the first book in the series the wilds of Linlow the wilds of Linlow Castle and also I think a short story at the end which I haven't read yet back to the Ray Kess <laughs> So I was listening to the audio book because I was busy. Today is actually Thanksgiving. So happy Thanksgiving. It's very overcast and rainy day today. So, but we're going to work with it. So I was listening to the audio book all day yesterday and I finally got to a point where I was like, I felt comfortable stopping, but it was like 93%. So I technically count that as I finished the entire book. I'll actually show you to prove. Let's see. Ninety-three percent. 
and I decide to stop. And the reason why is because the characters finally got to like a good place and I could kind of predict how the rest of the things would wrap up and I was just like very exhausted from the story, honestly, that I was just like, my characters are in a good place. I don't want to continue reading and let them muck it up again because this couple, I didn't enjoy this couple. Overall, I did not enjoy this couple. I appreciate what Scarlett Peckham was trying to do. I appreciate the message she was trying to send, but this book just wasn't for me in general. A lot of it had to do with the couple themselves. They're very on again, off again, and I don't like that in a couple. I don't like reading a book where it's like, one step forward and two steps back the entire book and it just is so exhausting for me to read that type of story and it's just not what I enjoy and instead of coming out of the book feeling like a sense of like empowerment and promoting like a feminist message which I think was what she intended to do instead it just felt like a recounting of a bunch of trauma that women face under the patriarchy and I was just like okay I know all this and I don't want to rehash everything that's wrong <laughs> with the world and how women have suffered over and over and over again. That's just not my idea of a good time. It's not what I enjoy reading. I think that this book focuses way too much on the trauma associated with sex. Serafina's whole identity is wrapped around the idea that sex has harmed her in some way or another, and it continues to harm her even in the present day, even with the hero, Adam. She doesn't feel like she's in control of her sex life. She doesn't feel like she's taking power back. It feels like it's ruling her and it's hurting her and she's using it to self-harm. She really is. I'm gonna talk about some specific scenes in the book, so I wanna give out a trigger warning for a lot of things, for grief, for loss of a child, for miscarriage, for abuse, for alcoholism. I think I'm covering it all. Basically, there's a lot, a lot of trauma that goes along with this book and I want to talk about why I feel like this story did not land with me. I did go into this book expecting for the heroine to feel like she was empowered by sex and she took control of her life by owning up to her sexuality and for enjoying sex outside of the marriage bed. And I was really looking forward to how the author chose to explore that, but instead it was sex and society ruling her. <laughs> she used sex in a way that was basically self-harm. At one point she threw herself at the hero and she was telling him, and she was drunk at the at the time, like raving drunk, and she threw herself at the hero and she was just like, fuck me and like hurt me, I want it to hurt, like I want you to take me rough and stuff like that. And I'm just like, this is not, this is not what I was expecting. This was not I feel so sad for her that she has suffered so much trauma in her life. Um, first with the man who took her virginity and promised her to marry her and then turned around and married someone else. Started rumors about her promiscuity and then her parents abandoned her. I feel so bad that all that led to her leading a life where outwardly she's telling everybody that she doesn't care what they think and that she owns sex and she's just like, yes, I do what I want and I'm not ashamed of it, but inside she's very ashamed of it. She really is. And it, it was very, it was very sad. It's so sad. Another thing about that scene, which I found incredibly hard to read, the scene where Serafina was drunk and throwing herself at Adam, telling him to hurt her, was that it was also a very big trigger for Adam because he grew up in a household with an alcoholic father who abused his mother, who was very lecherous toward his mother when he was drunk and, you know, caused him pain. And this is the woman that he cares about, showed nothing but kindness to, and she's doing this to him of course unknowingly, and I think another problem is they never talked about their traumas to each other. It always came out like the actual what was bothering them and the traumas associated with their past that always came out in like a fit of rage when they were upset with each other and they, instead of like having like conversations, frank conversations, it was always to say like, you've hurt me and I'm done with you and this is why you've hurt me. And the other person had no idea that they were hurting them because they just wouldn't talk about it. And so by that point, by the time they 
started to talk about their traumas, they wanted nothing to do with, or one wanted nothing to do with the other, and it was just so exhausting. And then the other one felt so bad, like, I didn't know. I'm like, of course you didn't know. You guys don't talk. And not only was sex such a negative thing in the heroine's life, in Serafina's life, it was a very negative thing for the hero as well, because the hero was berating himself for how much he loved sex with his first wife, his wife that he lost in childbed, and he feels, he blames himself because they enjoyed having sex and the doctor said not to have another child because it could be detrimental to his wife's health and they loved each other, they had sex anyway, she got pregnant and then she died in childbirth. So he associates sex with someone he loves with death. And there was a scene that didn't really sit right with me because as a reader, I understood his issues with having sex with somebody and he kept telling Serafina like I don't want to go all the way I don't want to have like full penetrative sex and she's like I have a condom and we can use this let me show you how it worked and it felt like pressuring him into doing something that he really didn't want to do they ended up by having sex and guess what the condom broke and I was just like this is his worst nightmare so I feel like Scarlet Peckham went out of the way out of her way to put these characters in the worst possible scenario it's like when she was plotting the book, she's like, what is the hardest road that I can put my characters on to get to their HEA? And how many roadblocks can I set up that specifically taps into their trauma? And that's exactly what she did. Not only is it Adam's worst nightmare to get someone else pregnant because he's afraid that they'll also die in childbirth, but it is Serafina's worst nightmare to be pregnant because she fell pregnant when she was 17 and she thought she was in love and he married someone else. So now she was left pregnant and alone. She suffered a miscarriage and then she blamed herself because she was upset by being pregnant and she blamed the baby and then whenever she went into labor early and the baby died, she was like, it's my fault that the baby died because I felt badly towards the baby. So now she's punishing herself. She's deathly afraid to get pregnant. And so she does end up by getting pregnant when Adam's condom breaks. And I really don't like that we went down this road that she ends up by getting pregnant with Adam. It felt like she was being redeemed by being given another chance at motherhood. I would have preferred for her to not have the past trauma of being going through a miscarriage and then getting pregnant because there's just a lot that's happening. There's so many traumas in the background. Like we need to get rid of one <laughs> because I don't like the message that it was sending that by having a second chance at motherhood, she was being redeemed. Something that she didn't want to happen in the first place, but once it did happen, she was like, I don't deserve to be a mother. I don't deserve to be a mother, which I'm assuming it's all gonna go fine. I stopped before she had the baby or whatever. I'm assuming that's gonna happen, like the epilogue or whatever. But I just didn't like it. I would prefer if she never got pregnant and she found happiness with Adam's two children, which I feel like those two kids were props. It was another reason why Adam couldn't be with Serafina was for the sake of his children's future. But yeah, I just felt like the whole pregnancy thing at the end just didn't work for me because of her past trauma with like the miscarriage and the way that this pregnancy came about. There was so much drama associated with her getting pregnant this time around. Her not trusting Adam enough to tell him and then whenever she decides to tell him, she finds out that Adam um, his whole job and being able to pay back his brother-in-law, the loan that he had given to him years ago, depended on the patronage of the man who first wronged Serafina in the first place. And it's like, how are all of these ties <laughs> happening in the background? How many times can they unintentionally hurt each other and then sort of blame the other person for unintentionally hurting them? I appreciate a broken heroine, but I really did feel like Adam did a lot more emotional work when it came to the relationship. Serafina lashed out a lot and I feel like Adam just kind of took it and I just wish that he would have stood up to her a little bit more. I think that Serafina needed a kind understanding man but I feel like he let her steamroll him just a little too much. There's only so many times that you can let somebody just lash out at you and just take it until the relationship starts feeling a little bit unbalanced and I do feel like the relationship feels unbalanced. I've been like sitting here for like 15 minutes waiting for that noise in the background to stop but it's not so I'm just gonna continue talking over it and I'm really sorry for it. There's one more thing I do want to mention before I move on to my last duchess and it's I also did not like how every man who was not the hero 
or another man who is very telegraphed to be a potential hero for another one of Serafina's friends. I'm assuming she's gonna have a book in the future, Lady Bell. So Adam and Jack were the only men who behaved with like a shred of kindness. The rest of the men were terrible, horrible. They thought horrible things about women. They thought horrible things about Serafina. There was a scene in the village where like the entire village um, was doing like this parade and they had like effigies of people who they did not like and Serafina was one of them. Like everyone behaves so terribly towards Serafina, especially men. And I don't like that kind of generalization no matter who you're doing it to because I talk a lot about how I hate in romance, how um, sometimes authors feel the need to villainize every single woman in a story besides the heroine. Like every woman is a mean girl and I don't like that. And in the same way, I don't like how every man in this story is so unlikable except for the hero. It just does not reflect the kind of like diversity that I feel like this story deserves. Like I feel like we deserve to see some more people who were sympathetic towards the heroine. Um, and her plight that were not women in her inner circle that were not the two heroes of this story well I mean Jack's not a hero but he's a future hero I just feel like we needed that <laughs> to have a little bit of hope in the world and yeah maybe I want a fantasy maybe I want a fantasy and historical where there is a woman who is not married and she has lovers and she has the support of at least one family member. She doesn't feel alone in the world. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I want that kind of story. I would like that kind of feminist. I enjoy sex for the sake of sex and I, it's not associated with the past trauma. I would like that kind of story. So I don't know what to rate this book because it really just exhausted me. The writing was pretty good. I do... And like I get why some people would be like, this is amazing. So I'm gonna settle on three stars right now, but I am just kind of exhausted by looking at this book right now. So I don't know, I don't know. We're gonna put it at three stars for now. Now we're gonna move on to My Last Duchess, which I really enjoyed. This was really fun and actually this would have been perfect for a wintry, snowy romance recommendation. But I already filmed that video. It's already out and up, but this is definitely such a good book to read during Christmas time. It has a lot of like snowy vibes. There's like this little festival that goes on in the book and it's just really enjoyable and I really liked it. The hero of this story, Hugo Linlow, has been very unlucky lately. First of all, he has been married twice his first wife he was he loved very much and he had three or four children with her can't remember there's a lot of kids there's eight kids total she died he remarried and his second wife also had four children or three children can't remember which one had four or three but she ran off with a lover so now he needs to find another duchess to basically be a mother to his children. His twin sister is actually suggesting this, like he's content to just be like, I'm, especially after my last wife who just like left me and you know, now we're divorced and who would want to marry a divorced man? But his sister's insistent being like, you deserve it. Th those kids deserve a mom. You need to go find another wife. So he goes to London, he goes to this ball. He immediately hones in on this particular woman who he has never set eyes on before. Ophelia is a widow. She was recently kind of widowed well within the last two years and she has a young daughter Viola and she is extremely maternal she actually likes to do a lot of the things that normally the governesses and nursemaids would do for children like she gets up at 5 a.m. whenever her daughter <laughs> wakes up in the morning her cousin Maddie which she's really hilarious she cracks me up she's a little bit shallow a little bit and I like the this diverse personality because Maddie's a little bit unlikable and I like that about her <laughs> but she calls a Ophelia an unnatural with the way that she is obsessed with her child. So Hugo sees Ophelia and she's like done with the ball. She wants to go home so that she can go to bed and be up and ready for her daughter Viola in the morning. He approaches Maddie being like, who is she? I need a name. Like I definitely want her. He bribes her coachman to get into her carriage and he is just like so smitten with her. <laughs> She's like, what are you doing? You don't know me and I'm not interested in being a duchess. That's a lot of responsibility and I'm definitely not interested in being the mother of eight children. Like I have one and that's enough. But he's so charming and there's definitely a bit of love at first sight, especially on his part. But what I really enjoyed about this book is it's not perfect. It's not all sunshine and roses. Like after they meet, it's not like, oh, now they're together. Ophelia thinks it's fast and it is fast and she's like, 
I don't know about this, but they start kissing and then she does invite him up to the bedroom. And what I really like about it is they don't sleep together right away. And cause she's uncomfortable. She hasn't experienced like passion since her first husband who they had a good marriage, but she wasn't like super in love with him. They just got along really well. So Hugo knows he's coming on really strong and he knows he has to pull back and they have like some pillow talk and they find out that they have different views on things. And Ophelia is like, well, this is definitely a reason why we are not suited. And I just don't see us together. And so I really like that. I really like that it's not just this straight shot to the altar, like I see you, I want you, we're definitely sexually compatible, we have this attraction to each other. It's also exploring how do you blend two families. And Ophelia, at first, thought she only had enough love in her heart for her own daughter. She's like, I love my daughter so much, I don't wanna like take time out of the attention that I should be giving my daughter to have to focus on a bunch of other kids. But when she meets his kids and when she sees how involved of a father he, he really is, which is unusual for a duke, she realizes that she was being crazy, that there's always room for more love. And I just really love the way that this story unfolded. It's really sweet. And I love how all of his children are named after warriors. I thought that that was really fun. I have not read any of the books in the Wild Linlow series. Linlow series or Wild series? I haven't read any of the books. This is like a prequel. So you can bet that I'm going to go pick up all of those books because I love this family. They're really cute as children. I can't wait to see what they are like as adults. Okay guys, it has been quite a journey for this reading vlog. I've been doing this vlog for like, I don't know, two and a half weeks, maybe more, maybe a full three weeks. I started this vlog after the Paranormal Romance Readathon. I started reading Diana Quincy and then I had a period of time where I just like could not read a bunch of books and I could not vlog and then finally I read these books this week and I really enjoyed two of them. <laughs> and the other two I had some issues with, but overall it was a really enjoyable reading experience. I hope that this vlog is not gonna be too long. I'm going to try to cut it down as much as it possibly can. And sometimes I go off on tangents, so yeah. If you like this video, give it a big thumbs up. And if you're not already subscribed to my channel, make sure that you subscribe to get notified on any future videos that I do. Thank you so much for watching and remember, life's better with a little HEA. Bye guys.